This is CBC Here and Now. Summer is finally here. So I'm at Bannerman Park enjoying the weather. I'll have your full forecast, but first, let's send it back to Carolyn in the studio with today's top news. Other than the leg and the head, I got minor cuts and bruises. I got very lucky. Struck by a car on a crosswalk, then hurled on top of another car. Now he's hoping witnesses to his hit and run will come forward. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Carolyn Stokes. Robert Howell is recovering at home now after being struck by a car in a brazen hit and run last Sunday. Police are seeking answers as to who hit him, then fled, leaving him lying injured in the middle of a busy intersection. Here now's Ryan Cook has our top story. Robert Howell's femur, the strongest bone in the human body, snapped. He's got about 60 staples throughout his body, including five staples to close a wound in his head. Other than the leg and the head, I got minor cuts and bruises. I got very lucky. Howell was walking across this intersection at Columbus and Black Marsh when a car made a quick left-hand turn onto Black Marsh Road. He never saw it coming. It catapulted him through the air and he collided with another vehicle. His head and body hit the car so hard, it smashed the window and destroyed the back door. Like the fact that I hit that car so hard that I buckled the door like completely in. It's like, it blows my mind. Police are now searching for the owner of a dark colored late model Jeep Patriot. They say it has significant damage to the front of the vehicle. Howell is recovering at home now. He's a father of six with four children under 10 and lives with a partner who was utterly terrified when she got the call. I was just glad that he wasn't dead um, at this point. I, I was fearing the worst, like the kids on the way out the door, I was crying, they were crying, it was very emotional. Okay. Howell has a message for the person who hit him. I want to know why. That's all I want to know. Why did he leave me there? What, like, accidents happen, I can forgive that. But to just leave a man bleeding on the road like that, that's cold. Cold and criminal. Ryan Cook, CBC News, St. John's. Well, a fire at a daycare in St. John's earlier this month is now considered suspicious. The Royal Newfoundland Constabulary has been investigating the fire at Mother Hen's daycare for weeks. It's still not clear how the fire started or exactly why police say it's suspicious now. Firefighters were called to Mother Hen's daycare on Rope Walk Lane in the middle of the night on July 3rd. The daycare is in a strip mall right next to a Filipino restaurant. The restaurant was closed for three weeks to clean up from the smoke damage, but the daycare is still shut down. Veterinarians around St. John's are warning pet owners of three confirmed cases of parvovirus in the city. The highly contagious disease can be fatal and is most dangerous to young puppies or dogs who haven't been fully vaccinated. Dr. Maggie Brown Burry with the Provincial Veterinary Medical Association says if your dog has been around other dogs and doesn't seem qu quite well, you should get them checked out. The test for parvovirus is simple and the results are usually available from any veterinarian within 20 minutes. Train travel is back in Newfoundland, sort of. Felt bumpy and awesome. The kids loved it, so I liked making the kids happy. We'll check out a new way to get around Corner Brook this summer, coming up on Here and Now. Well, a record was broken yesterday at the annual Telly 10 run in St. John's. Anne Johnston placed first with a time of 54 minutes and 24 seconds. She broke the all-time women's record by more than a minute. Jennifer Murren came in second place, just 30 seconds behind Johnston. Murren was the fastest woman last year and the year before. Kate Baisley placed third. She was the previous record holder. And as for the men, Colin Fewer placed first running the 10 miles in under 50 minutes. His time was 49 minutes and 49 seconds. Graydon Snyder came second with a time of just over 51 minutes and Matt Noseworthy placed third at just two seconds behind Snyder. We spoke to Ann Johnston and Colin Fewer about their wins and their training. I'm, I'm really happy, uh, really excited. You know, I, I'm kind of still in shock, I think a little bit, but yeah, definitely really happy. 
I had a real consistent year of training. I um, did the Boston Marathon back in the spring, so had a real good year of solid training, lots of miles, lots of hard work in the winter. Um, I was strong over in Boston and kind of, I think, took the strength from that training and tried to carry it forward until today. It's one day a year. It's always amazing to, to run that course and uh, see the people out on the course. It's just a beautiful energy and uh, it's fun, always a fun day. I think it was just kind of knowing kind of, you know, when to make a move. In years past, I've kind of gone out hard and paid for it in the second half. So, you know, you always worry that's going to happen again. So uh, it's kind of just knowing to push yourself hard enough um, to kind of, run strong but not too hard that you can make it to finish. The competition is so good there that I mean if you know if I'm if I fade by a minute and that's easy enough in the heat or you get an upset stomach, uh, you gotta be on your game. These guys are training hard too when they're quick and uh, you know you don't take any any competitor lightly. I mean, it was hot. Uh, certainly, I, I took water pretty much at every station. I felt it was pretty hot and wanted to stay ahead of that. Um, but, you know, overall, you know, I've ran in worse, so it was it was pretty good. Well, temperatures were a little better. Um, well, probably a lot better than last year, so uh, I felt, you know, just I felt better training going into this one than last year, and uh, and just, you know, one of the better days we had in the last 10 years, so, you know, I guess you got to try to take advantage of that. and. You know, coming through, I was happy to see that finish line for sure. Um, you know, I, I definitely gave it all I had today, so um, I'm, I, I wouldn't have changed anything. I'm happy with how it went. Yeah. You know, things just got to come together right, so um, I sort of felt this morning I have a good shot at going under 50. It, at the very, I would like to be a few seconds faster, 30 or 40 seconds faster, but, you know, I, I went for it, and uh, I just slowed a little bit in the last three miles, so but I still think I can run faster, right? So I'll live to fight another day here, and uh, I got other aspirations. I got, I got other... Um, uh, I got our goals. I, I want to run a marathon in the next year or so, so uh, I just hopefully I'll recover from the telly here in the next 10 days or so, and then I'll set my sights on, uh, you know, a fast marathon, which I haven't done yet. Oh, it was perfect weather yesterday for the Tele 10, certainly here in St. John's. Dare I say today, even better. Uh, an absolutely gorgeous afternoon today. Temperatures quite warm, so we're out at Bannerman Park enjoying the sunshine at the splash pad, getting a little bit wet every time uh, the kids start to move stuff around. But uh, as far as the weather goes, we are seeing some thunderstorms moving through Labrador. They're starting to make their way towards the west coast. That risk continues for the next couple of hours. And then as we head through the day tomorrow, another beautiful day as far as sun and cloud go, but we do have that risk of thunderstorms. I'll have all those details, your full forecast coming up. Looks great out there. Now to another uh, different kind of water story. Uh, the city of St. John's is calling on the federal government to keep its promise to pay for 50% of a $250 million wastewater treatment facility. This is the Riverhead facility on the south side of St. John's Harbor. The federal legislation now requires St. John's to build a secondary wastewater treatment facility with an estimated cost of $250 million. Right now, the federal government says it will pay 43% of that bill, but Mayor Danny Breen says that's not enough. From our perspective, we can't put ourselves in the, in the taxpayers of the city and the taxpayers of the region in that position uh, where we know going in that we're going to be over budget on a, on a facility. A book about uh, Labrador residential school survivor Toby Obed is selling out of bookstores in Poland. It's only been out about six weeks, but it's being called one of the most important books of the year. Obed's story is resonating in that country. Here now's Katie Breen explains why. This is the moment. Residential school survivor Toby Obed accepting Justin Trudeau's apology. In 2017, the Prime Minister was in Labrador, saying sorry for Canada's part in residential schools here. Polish journalist Joanna Girakonoszko was working in Toronto at the time. She saw a photo of the moment and knew it would be her first book. In English, the title translates to The 27 Deaths of Toby Obed, named for each of the obstacles Obed had to overcome in his lifetime, starting from age four, when he was first taken from his home. I think it is proper for us to accept the apology from the government of Canada. Literary critic Michal Nogash works for the biggest newspaper in Poland. He says The 27 Deaths of Toby Obed is one of the most important books ever written and published by a Polish author. About 4,000 copies of the book were originally printed, and some bookstores have already sold out. Nogash says there's a quiet popularity about it. The author is new, so there wasn't a big splash with the book, but people are recommending it to their friends and sharing it on social media. 
According to the author, it's resonating for two reasons. The shock factor that Canada did something like that, and then relatability. And we also have our own stories of kids being incarcerated in schools and being um, victims of different priests and nuns' um, abusive actions. So the history of Toby and other survivors that moved from being a victim to being a survivor, that have moved from being um, a helpless child to being um, a courageous adult, is something we can all learn from and grow from. So I think that although it's a very local story, it's a very Canadian story, uh, it's also a great handbook for Poland and other European countries on how to embark on reconciliation. The author says Poland isn't in a place where it's willing to accept the fact that the church has wronged some people. Obed hopes his story will help the country get there. Like once a week I go to the post office waiting, um, excitedly anticipating the arrival of the book. And when I did get it, it was like I have it in my hand. You know, I'm actually holding it. And this is written by a woman who was way across on the other side of the world. For now, Obed can't actually read the book as it's written because it's in Polish, but given the popularity, the author says the publisher is thinking about having it translated into English, something Obed would like to see. I would really like to read it. Katie Breen, CBC News, St. John's. Now to Corner Brook, where a new tourist attraction is on wheels, literally. The city's new street train is a hit. Here and now's Lindsay Bird takes us on board. <laughs> At first sight, Cornerbrook's new street train looks a little silly, like an ultra-Canadian Thomas the Tank Engine. But it's enchanted crowds of people. It felt bumpy and awesome. Would you do it again? Yes. In fact, I would sleep and live on the train. <laughs> I love it. I like looking at every part of the city I could see. The kids loved it, so I liked making the kids happy. That's Was it their the request? It was their request, yeah. They saw it like whistling around the corner and they all started freaking out. So, you know, we had to oblige them. At every stop, train goers await. On the sunniest days, some have even had to be turned away from the Toonie ride through Cornerbrook's downtown. The city initially hoped 100 people would ride the train daily. So far this summer, it's averaging 400. You know, we thought it would just add something new and signal to the businesses around that we're serious about the tourism game, but... Uh, no, I, I don't think that any of us really anticipated, I guess, how, uh, how uh, much of a smile it would bring to just the general population. So. The city teamed up with the Port Authority for a one-time lease on the train from a Halifax company. Parsons says the city was prepared to lose up to $25,000 on its tourism gamble, but the boom in ridership might mean it breaks even. But either way, Parsons says this is the boost Cornerbrook needs to remake itself as a tourism town. I think that this is well worth it. If you talk to the businesses in the downtown and the tourism industry, I don't think you'll see any quibbles about that. Uh, from an economic development standpoint, it's a, it's a definite winner. The city is now looking at bringing the train back for the summer of 2020, if there's an appetite which so far seems there is. Do you think you'd ride the train again? Oh, yeah. We're going for another lap. We're not getting out. We're going for another lap. <laughs> yeah. There's still time to try the train for yourself. It runs until mid-October, if you can get a seat. Lindsay Bird, CBC News, Cornerbrook. That's a live shot of beautiful Bannerman Park. That's where Ashley Brawweiler is right now, soaking up all that sunshine. But she's not off the hook completely. She'll also have your forecast just ahead.
Bees are booming. They have been busy all summer long collecting nectar and pollen, and today we're opening up the hive to see how much honey they've made. So this is what prevents the queen from getting up into the honey boxes. She can't fit through these little spaces. She's, uh, she's too big. We keep the queen separate, so she's laying in the brood box, or the, the main part of the hive, and there won't be any eggs or larvae up into where the honey supers are, so we'll just get pure honey. So we're actually blending in some empty frames and empty boxes. Because you're separating them from where they're closest to their brood, their baby bees, what happens, they really want to make more honey and keep it close to the brood, so they'll really, really power up and get more honey out of the hive. You can see the larvae right down there. Like the bees are feeding the larvae? They are, yeah. Yep. They seem so exposed, but I guess not. <laughs> no, not when they're in the hive. How many bees do you think are in here? Oh god, there's looking at the bottom box, there's there's a good sixty thousand bees here. Wow. We have a baby bee being born right here. Little head is sticking out. So that's a new bee just being born. That is, so this is a good example of worker brood here, honey, then you've got worker brood, and here is drone brood. Male. Male, male bees. Turn around. <laughs> a few bees on you. <laughs> there you go. Covered in bees. I love the sound of it. So how much honey do you think is in the hive? I'd say there's a good 50, 60 pounds of capped honey right now. Oh, wow. And we still have two, two plus months to go. So uh, there's there's going to be quite a bit of honey coming out of that hive this year. And we have some right here? Yeah, we're going to taste it now and just show you. So all we do is we push the spoon in. Oh, wow. Look at that. There you go. You want to try I'll that? I'll taste that one. Oh my goodness, that is amazing. Honey from your own backyard. Oh, it doesn't get any better than that. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. You're welcome. <laughs> well, that was my day yesterday uh, with the bees. They're doing so well, Ashley. Yes, they look like they are. You're covered in bees there. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> but I haven't been stung yet, so, but you have. Yeah, I was just going to say you didn't get stung. Yes, I did. Uh, what was that now? Two weeks ago, three weeks ago? No, maybe it was longer than that. Yeah, yeah, I a think, little bit longer. Maybe. Yep. The bee got into, yeah. uh, into your shoe when, when you came over to, to meet my bees in the backyard and uh, unfortunately you <laughs> got stung on the ankle. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it didn't feel that bad though. It was it was way less pain than I thought it was actually going to be. But uh, yeah, absolutely beautiful day you had for beekeeping yesterday, mm -hmm. and uh, a number a number of areas this weekend saw their temperatures soar to the 30 degree range, and uh, today another beautiful day. So we'll take a look at those high uh, temperatures this afternoon for most areas sitting in the high 20s, 21 degrees here in St. John's, 24 for Bonavista, Twillingate reached 20. Six degrees today and then we've got uh, 29 for Deer Lake. Now those temperatures up through Labrador uh, a little chilly so only sitting around 17 degrees for most and then cool up along the coast. Those temperatures still sitting in the single digits and we've dipped a little bit uh, for St. John sitting at 19 degrees, Gander at 25. Now I did mention uh, earlier that we saw some thunderstorms and you can kind of see that up through Labrador right now uh, with some of that uh, bouncing satellite radar back but um, we're starting to see that cloud cover push for the west coast as well and with that we are seeing some showers that risk of thunderstorms will continue for uh, probably the next hour or so I would say but we are looking at uh, showers for most of central and towards uh, the Avalon just the potential for showers nothing too significant but we could see that by the time tomorrow morning rolls around and then staying unsettled for Labrador as well. There's that risk of thunderstorms that I have in there uh, again for the next hour or so likely. Some of it's already starting to push off. And then uh, as far as those temperatures go, still quite mild overnight tonight. Anywhere from 15 to 17 degrees, a little bit cooler down along the south coast though, Port of Basque, Marystown. 
uh, around 14 degrees tonight, but still a beautiful evening. Other than that risk of showers, again, it'll likely be more uh, partly to mostly cloudy through the night tonight. The southwesterly is still quite breezy though, 20 to 40 kilometers per hour along the west coast. Those winds should ease. And then overnight tonight, dipping down or staying generally in the single digits up through Nain and Cartwright, again with that risk of thunderstorms there. And then showers possible for Happy Valley Goose Bay, same for Lab City. Overnight tonight, you're sitting between 10 and 12 degrees with those light winds. Now, tomorrow, uh, the heat is going to stick around. That's good news, but there is a little bit of a cold front that will sweep through. So we could see some afternoon pop-up thunder showers for the island. Uh, generally looking at a mix of sun and cloud, though, through the day. And then up through Labrador, uh, cloudy periods, I would say, through the day. Lab City. Later on in the evening, uh, that's when that shower activity will push in and head towards Happy Valley Goose Bay by the early morning hours. Still have that risk of thunderstorms in there for you, though, for Lab West. And then heading towards, uh, or for the island, rather, there's where you're looking at that risk of thunderstorms. Again, pop up in nature, likely scattered through the day, but those temperatures still staying quite nice in the high 20s. Tomorrow is when we're actually going to start to see some of that humidity move in. Uh, Placentia sitting around 20 degrees, Marystown uh, 27, and then heading towards central. Again, have that risk of thunderstorms in right across the board. 28 in Grand Falls, Windsor. Harbor Breton a little cooler at 20, uh, rather 17 degrees towards Port of Ask 22. And then uh, up along the west coast, chance of showers. Again, mix of sun and cloud more than likely. And then temperatures in the mid to high 20s. Uh, now note those cooler temperatures up through Labrador. T uh, 10 degrees is the afternoon high in Cartwright and likely only sitting in the single digits again for Northern Labrador, heading towards Lab City, sitting around the 20 degree mark. Now, uh, as we head through the next couple of days, it does look like we'll stick with this pattern, but I'll have all the details coming up. I'm really happy to be a part of this whole operation. I'll see how good it is. <laughs> Moving people, cars, and supplies to Labrador's north coast, the new ferry's maiden voyage is ahead on Here and Now.
Labrador has a new vessel and a new operator. Labrador Marine is now tasked with servicing Labrador's north coast, an essential service for those isolated communities. All eyes are on the new ship and the new service provider. Our Jacob Barker got a front row seat on the first trip. Here's part one of a series, Maiden Voyage. The Humatic W. This ship is new to Labrador waters. It now has a big responsibility, serving the people of Nunatsiavut and Natwashish, an area with no road in. Without this ship, there would be no efficient way for food, construction material, or anything to reach the coast. The crew aboard knows this and feels a sense of responsibility. We take a lot of pride in what we do, and I'm very uh, happy to be a part of helping communities on the coast get their uh, deliveries and stuff like that. I'm really happy to be a part of this whole operation. But the necessity of it means that any ship that enters these waters is under intense scrutiny. Everybody is watching and weighing in on the new boat. I know that people are curious how it's going to come, what's the outcome, but other than that, we have to find out what she's looking on the water when there's a heavy, when there's a heavy sea. Well, you're going to get people to complain, right? Yeah. You're not going to satisfy everybody. So that'd be my first time on her now, and I'll, I'll see how good it is. <laughs> These guys are first in line to be the first vehicle that rolls aboard the ship. It's the first time people in northern communities will be able to move along with their vehicles up the coast. I think it's convenient. You can load to put what you want in your truck, and you can take it, get off. You want to come up with your supplies or whatever, hey, you put it on the truck and go. The ship just arrived a few days prior, and crews had to hustle to get it certified for Canadian waters. Now they're hours behind schedule. Finally, the cars roll aboard. Ah, uh, good. That's number one. Keep them coming. <laughs> the decks are filled with cargo. It takes a while to get going. Uh, yeah, there's always a bit of hiccups, especially with the first time, but we're getting straightened out. I'm sure next time we'll be a little bit faster. A little bit of swearing going on, but we got, we got it, we got it. All right, well, we finally pushed off just a few minutes ago. There's Goose Bay behind me in the background, and we're on our way to wriggle it. Uh, we should be arriving there not until 6.30 in the morning, not because that's how long it's gonna take there, but because it'll have to wait for the light to come out before it can birth. Those that manage to get a cabin get settled in. Come inside. This is our home. What do you think of the room? Uh, not too bad. Uh, it's kind of small for four people. But it'll do. Brian Rich brought his family aboard as well as two trucks. He says while it's great to have that kind of access in and out of Natwashish, it means changes for his community. There'll be a lot of, a lot of tickets going around for cops. They're going to give out tickets because yeah. there's non-registered non vehicles up in there. It's all high, Highway Traffic Act, so it's going to be an issue for everyone, I see. While there is a lot of discussion about the pros and the cons of the new vessel, Christy Shepard of Rigolette senses history. She's asking everyone aboard to sign the book she's reading. So it seems that we're coming into a new era, and as such, it just seems um, appropriate that we would mark it. So a lot of people are saying that they've come specifically for this trip, knowing it's a maiden voyage. Some have gotten stuck due to weather or um, complications in travel or whatnot. So everyone's really excited in their different ways to be aboard. So it's just, I think that, that was a nice record. I haven't done it myself yet, but I need to get on that. But otherwise, yeah, I think it's pretty awesome. It's just after 6.30 in the morning here and we've arrived in Rigolet and right now crews are trying to put the ramp down for the first time and that's something that people are watching very closely. Like getting the ship going, the alterations to the docks are happening at the last minute, but the ramp does come down okay. The loading area is still gravel. The concrete still needs to be poured. But accommodations are made and the freight starts coming off and so do the vehicles. It's different. Yeah. Well, a lot different. Yeah. At least you don't have to walk on and walk off though. Well, Weber lives on the North Coast. Yeah. His concern is with the South Coast communities, which used to be a regular run for the old vessel, the Northern Ranger. But now that schedule has been scaled back. I'm from Cartwright. Oh, okay. uh, my summer home is spotted on them, so I like to see the ferry go that way so I can just take my family and get on the boat and wriggle it and go to Spotter Black Eagle and get off and drive to Spotted. 
The arrival of the ship is a relief for Sandy Michelin, whose store shelves have emptied out, waiting for the Hummetic W to arrive. For her, the new service comes at a loss. Disappointed that we're losing our Lewisport service because we did get a lot of our merchandise from the island. Her supply chain completely disrupted by the new service, and she's only had the year to figure out new ways to get her goods. Having it come through Goose Bay will be a struggle, she says, and it could mean an increase in prices. This is my first um, lot of goods coming in, so I'm telling my invoices and see my product, what I have, and then crunch numbers. I, I do anticipate some increase. The last of the cargo comes off the ship, a bumpy road to the first stop, but it got there okay. The day is still young, and the rest of the coast awaits as the Hummetic W sets sail again. Next stop, Makovic. And that was here and now's Jacob Barker on board the Comatic W with the first part of our series, Maiden Voyage. Tune in tomorrow night for part two. Well, returning now to tonight's top story, a week ago, Robert Howell was on a crosswalk near Columbus Drive and Black Marsh Road in St. John's when seemingly out of nowhere, he was struck by a car. His body was sent flying into the air and into a second vehicle. Police believe the driver who struck Howell is a man in his 30s. He fled the scene. Robert Howell spoke to CBC about the accident. I, I can't believe it. Like the fact that I hit that car so hard that I buckled the door like completely in. It's like, it blows my mind. He shattered my femur and it stuck out through my leg. So now I have a steel rod reinforcing that. And I've got five staples here in my head where I headbutt it the second window. Other than the leg and the head, I got minor cuts and bruises. I got very lucky. I'm not afraid to admit that. <laughs> I am thankful to be here to actually talk to you about this. The, the paramedic said I must have been made of steel. The cop said I'm not from this planet. <laughs> like, it, it's, it's blowing everyone's mind. And the fact that I was released from the hospital three days later, like the amount of progress I've made, ev everyone is stunned. Yeah, I've given it a lot of thought. I'm, I'm not angry because he hit me. Accidents happen. It's the fact that he left me there. That's what hurts the most. I just, I want to know why. That's all I want to know. Why did he leave me there? What, like, accidents happen. I can forgive that. But to just leave a man bleeding on the road like that, that's cold. I got the call. The call didn't sound very promising. Um, they said they were working on him, that I should get there immediately. Uh, I immediately broke down, so got there as fast as I could. He was gone to CAT scan when I first got there. He came back and he was just busted up, stitches across his head. He didn't have anything bandaged up at this point. Uh, so I could just see all the staples. There's probably about 60 in his body. I was just glad that he wasn't dead um, at this point. I, I was fearing the worst, like the kids on the way out the door, I was crying, they were crying. It was very emotional. Um, so as soon as he you know, he was kind of out of it, but he started talking to me and he did a video call with the kids before surgery. And yeah, I was just feeling super lucky at that point. I'm, I'm thankful to be here and, but there's, there's still a lot of anger and resentment because I'm starting to feel like there won't be any closure, but I'm keeping my hopes up. This is a small city in a small province. Somebody eventually is going to come forward. Searching the sea from the air, we join DFO scientists as they look for the endangered right whale. And we'll talk to Dr. Jack Lawson about why this aerial survey is so important.
welcome back to Here and Now. I'm here at Hangar 3 at St. John's International Airport where we're about to take to the skies with DFO scientists as they prepare for their marine mammal survey. And joining me now is whale expert Jack Lawson. So first of all, can you describe what's going to be happening today? So our plan today is we're going to take this aircraft and we're going to go down to Placentia Bay and we have some transects or lines that we're going to be flying. We're looking for primarily right whales at this stage in the survey, but also looking for some seals. So how can you search for whales from the sky? Isn't that, isn't that difficult? It's normally difficult on most aircraft, but this is a special aircraft. If you can kind of see on the sides, there's a couple of stations that have these large bubble windows and they allow the observers to put their heads right out and look straight down from the side. And in addition, we also have two very expensive large cameras in the rear of the aircraft that are taking constant photographs as we fly of the water below. Mm -hmm. So a lot of attention paid recently to right whales. Uh, why are you focusing on searching for them right now? So obviously we're interested in knowing where these animals are because that tells us a little bit about where they might be at risk. So if you find right whales in a shipping lane area or if you find right whales in an area where there's fixed fishing gear, we want to know that. And so a lot of effort's been paid, as you know, in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, where their animals have been struck by vessels or caught in gear. But the question is always, well, are they in other areas? You would be concerned about the Scotian Shelf or around Newfoundland and Labrador. So historically, we know that right whales have been seen around Newfoundland. We've got them on the acoustic recorders every year in Placentia Bay. They've been seen in Whitless Bay a few years ago, so they're around Newfoundland. Can you talk about the status of the right whale right now? Uh, how, how threatened are they? Well, if you can imagine, the species numbered in the thousands, hundreds of years ago, and then the whalers, and when they came to western, the western Atlantic, began to hunt for various species. And the right whale was a great animal to hunt because they were often uh, slow, and when they were killed, they would float, so they were the right animal to catch. And so the numbers declined drastically as a result of whaling. So when whaling stopped, there was always kind of a low population abundance. And even as of today, after years of not whaling, the numbers are still just a little over 400. It was 415 before the start of the summer. There was a, a little bit of good news recently, wasn't there? A, a four mother and calf yeah. uh, w w pairs were found? That's right. So recently, because we have so much aerial survey effort in the Gulf right now and vessels and so on people watching they were able to find these mother and calf pairs so we're quite happy that the females are breeding that's great but you know when you consider we've seen four calves maybe and there was a total of seven born this year that we know of and eight died adults so the balance isn't there for a big recovery yet. What's it like for you as someone who really dedicates his life to uh, the well-being of whales uh, to see kind of what's going on with this particular species right now. Yeah, it's, it's tough because when you look at the animal itself, its behavior makes it sort of the most, the riskiest animal to be around human activity. So it spends a lot of time at the surface. They get into these what's called surface active groups or SAGs. And when they're in these surface active groups, they're rolling and splashing and paying attention to themselves and nothing else. So it seems like they're frequently in these active groups in shipping lanes. And when a ship approaches, they might submerge, but only just a little bit and hover there and listen to when the ship's coming. So they do all the things that put them at greatest risk when there's human activities. So far we've had excellent sighting conditions today. The uh, sea is very flat, so it makes for great sighting. So we've seen really interesting animals like leatherback sea turtles, which usually you wouldn't see unless the sea was very flat because the only thing that usually pokes up out of the water is just the tip of their head or the back of their shell. So we've been lucky to see those. But on the other end of the scale, we've also seen a couple of fin whales, which are the second largest animals in the world after blue whales. And we've had a scattering of white beaked dolphins and a couple of unknown dolphins. All right, so all finished now. How did it go? I thought it went very well. We tested out our new software and cameras. We got a few tweaks to make for tomorrow, another test flight, but uh, we were able to see turtles, whales, went around Whitless Bay, and of course, being out over Newfoundland on a sunny day, you can't get better than that. <laughs> and so what's next? 
So tomorrow we'll go out and actually do a formal survey of Placentia Bay where we were today now that we know that everything works and we'll actually do a formal survey of that. We might do it again Sunday because we're, we're training up new observers and they'll get a chance to play with the software that I did today. And then Monday we start our big survey. And eventually where will all of this information go? So the plan is this fall we have a meeting in St. John's actually in October where we'll be presenting the results of all the aerial surveys that DFO has been doing in the Gulf here around Newfoundland on the Scotian Shelf by all different aircraft. So we've got this one, we've got a, a couple of Sky Masters and other things flying in the Gulf. We've got King Airs for conservation protection flying. So we've got all kinds of aircraft. We have to put that all together into one big report and say, here's where we flew, when, and what we saw. So hopefully around here, I'm hoping we don't see right whales around Newfoundland and Labrador. They're amazing, but I'd like to see them not here. <laughs> and why is that? Well, I just worry, you know, with the risk of ship strikes and, and vessel collisions and so on, I, I'd rather have them stay somewhere else and not have to worry about them. So it's actually kind of a good thing that we didn't see any right whales today. Yeah, I mean, you, you'd love to see it because it's a rare species and we have, as I said before, uh, we have seen, heard them on our acoustic recorders in Placentia Bay, but in some ways I'd rather not see them in our waters. <laughs> well, thank you so much for taking us up. It was a real treat. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs>Welcome back everyone and Ashley I see that you have found uh, a delicious way to keep cool on a beautiful summer night in Bannerman Park. Yeah I'm ruining my dinner but uh, <laughs> or my supper but that's okay. The what fries flavor did you so choose? Good, I almost uh, salted caramel oh, my nice. favorite. Very nice. But it had some strawberry ice cream too but this is delicious it's gonna be hard to uh, eat dinner now. <laughs> <laughs> It is absolutely gorgeous out here. So many people are enjoying the sunshine because, uh, as we mentioned before, summer's finally here. It's so nice to see. <laughs> but um, as far as uh, what those temperatures go, we talked about the forecast earlier and uh, what we're going to see tomorrow. This heat is going to stick around. So we are going to see that risk, though, of thunderstorms as we head through uh, the first half of tomorrow. And then uh, eventually things will clear out. So <clears throat> let's uh, 
see the temperature is about 27 degrees, 28 for Grand Falls, Windsor. And then as we head towards uh, the West Coast, you're going to stay with that heat as well. And again, pretty humid through the afternoon tomorrow up through Labrador. Not the case, though. Those temperatures are going to dip significantly. Uh, 10 degrees is the afternoon high for Cartwright, Happy Valley, Goose Bay, 15 degrees. And then Lab City sitting around 20 for tomorrow. Now, as we head into Wednesday's forecast, look at those temperatures. Another uh, hot day, especially through Central and the West Coast, anywhere from 29 to potentially 30 degrees with that humidity. It'll likely feel closer to 33, 34 degrees. And then as we head towards the Avalon sunshine, for the most part, overnight we could see that risk of showers, but 22 degrees should be the afternoon high. And then up through Labrador, again, hanging on to these cooler temperatures, only reaching the single digits essentially along the coast. You can see even down through the northern peninsula, those temperatures are going to start to dip down 12 degrees uh, as an afternoon high for Wednesday. That's well below seasonal for this time of year. And then Lab City sitting at 18. Now looking ahead over the next five days for St. John's and Eastern Newfoundland, uh, generally sitting in the 20 degree range. So we're going to stay there and then stay humid uh, essentially through Thursday. It does look like that risk of showers will move in for Friday and then for Saturday sunshine right now and 22 degrees. So it does look like a lovely weekend. Those overnight lows still sitting in the mid to high teens as well through central though this is where things start to get a little bit more unsettled so essentially have the chance of showers through the forecast right into saturday it won't be a rain uh, washout still looking at plenty of sunshine through the day uh, but look at those temperatures 28 to 30 degrees by thursday start to see a little bit of a, a cooling trend which will likely be welcome uh, for the weekend and then for Western Newfoundland, similar uh, temperatures, not quite as warm though, about 28 degrees by Wednesday. Thursday, that rain moves in 23 and then sitting uh, between the 20, 22 degree range for uh, the weekend with that chance of showers. But again, seeing the sun peak out at times. Now for Eastern Labrador, there's your temperatures in the teens. So gonna stay cool right across the board. Uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, peaks of sun with that chance of showers. And then it looks like it'll stay gray right towards uh, the rest of the weekend. And then that's the case for Western Labrador as well. As those temperatures dip, 20 degrees, 18 on Wednesday, and then temperatures in the teens as we head towards the weekend. So uh, I'm going to show you the weather photo today, an absolutely gorgeous one. I'm guessing by the fact that I had so many photos like this from the weekend, this is what everybody was doing, uh, enjoying that weather. So take a guess where this photo was taken, and I'll tell you after the break. Thanks, Ashley. Well, turning now to some national news, the intensive search for two teen fugitives has shifted slightly westward from the town of Gillam, Manitoba. A possible sighting of the pair yesterday near a garbage dump in the even more isolated community of York Landing sparked the redirection of the search. Officers searched the York Landing area throughout the night and continue their efforts today. The Royal Canadian Air Force is also assisting today with the search. Our officers have not made contact with the individuals, and so we are not yet in a position to confirm that these are the wanted suspects. In the summer, York Landing is accessible only by ferry or by air. While it's just 90 kilometers from Gillam, there is no direct road. The dense bush in the area has been cut back for rail and hydro lines, making a cross-country trip possible, though challenging. Cam McLeod and Briar Smigelski are wanted in connection with three murders. Authorities are warning the public to avoid approaching the suspects and call police if they're spotted.
Welcome back to Here and Now. We're going to head back to Bannerman Park where Ashley is live tonight on this gloriously warm, sunny evening. Uh, Ashley, how's it going down there? Yeah, it is absolutely beautiful out. Uh, I'm going to walk home, I think. <laughs> Enjoy the rest of the evening. Uh, beautiful day and a beautiful evening to play ball. And I'm joined by Tyler here who just played. Uh, did you guys win? Uh, we won by default. Oh, by default. Why? Because the other team wasn't there? They didn't have enough players. <laughs> did you even get to play? Yeah, we played three innings. Okay. And uh, what's your favorite thing about the summer weather so far? Uh... It's warm. <laughs> Is this your favorite uh, type of weather to play ball in? Yeah. And how many games have you guys won so far? Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> Are you playing any other sports other than ball this summer? Um, I'm playing basketball and hockey. Ba baseball, sorry? Basketball and hockey. And uh, why do you have two bats in your bag? Uh, <laughs> what? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I just use one has the big barrel and my friends like the other one ah, oh that's nice that's what i like when my friends bring the baseball or the bats that i like all right well uh i have a weather photo that uh, i was showing you guys a little bit uh, earlier so let's take a look at that photo one more time we'll get carolyn to uh to take over that all right, it is a great shot uh, there for sure uh dooley lake where's dooley lake where is Dooley Lake? Yeah. In Labrador City. Gorgeous Labrador shot. Labrador City. Uh, yeah, the, the map isn't working right now. <laughs> so uh, we can't show uh, this picture um, where it's located on the map. But what a beautiful shot crying out for some roasted marshmallows and some graham crackers <laughs> and some chocolate squares <laughs> to make some <laughs> s'mores. <laughs> That sounds exactly like what I would want to do. Yep. <laughs> oh, that is uh, actually interesting. That photo was taken by our uh, director, Rod Dobbin, who is uh, directing the show right now. Great job, Rod. That's a really beautiful picture. <laughs> and if anyone else out there has a picture that you'd like to send in, just uh, email it to us at nlphotos at cbc.ca. All right, well, that's it for us. Uh, Ashley, thanks so much. Uh, I guess, did you finish all of your ice cream or is it still waiting in the wings for you? It's waiting over there and it's melting. <laughs> melting. So back to all right, place. all right. <laughs> <laughs> Better let you go get to your ice cream and uh, giving me some ideas uh, there, maybe having a bit of dessert before dinner. Uh, some ice cream certainly hey. wouldn't go astray in this sunshine. <laughs> No, there's always room for dessert. Always. Yeah, always. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Ashley. We'll see you tomorrow. Good night. And that's it for us here in the studio. Thank you so much for joining us uh, tonight. I hope you can join us once again tomorrow night. Have a great evening, everyone.